Well, I don't know if you have heard, uh, but there's a football game tomorrow night. The Georgia Bulldogs are playing uh, some unknown team from Alabama. <laughs> Patty Irwood's got her. <laughs> she knew this was coming. <laughs> Actually, the Crimson Tide is about as well-known a team as you'll find anywhere in the country. But the other day, I, I got a text from a friend of mine, and this is what it said. Apparently, he'd written it to a number of people. He said, to undisclosed recipients, subject, national championship tickets. Can anyone help, can anyone help out a friend of a friend for me? He has two tickets for the Georgia national championship game on Monday, both box seats. He paid $2,000 each and didn't realize when he bought them that it was going to be on the same day as his wedding. If you're interested, he's looking for someone to take his place. It's at the Lutheran Church in Vinings at 6 o'clock. Her name is Tricia. She's a really sweet girl, and she will be the one wearing the white dress. <laughs> and he finished it with, go dogs, go dogs. Well, I'm sure I don't need to tell you that it is important to make and keep commitments. But what is even more important than making and keeping commitments is making and keeping the right commitments. Now, the Bible understands this. In fact, one of the commitments that the Bible says is very important is that for those of us who are Christians, that we allow our faith in Christ to find expression by being hospitable to other people. For example, if you were to go on the internet right now, and I'd rather you not take out your cell phones right now, but if you were to go on the internet right now or later this afternoon, and if you were to simply Google in the words hospitality in the Bible, you would literally find dozens of references to this whole matter of hospitality. Now this morning, we only chose two, and Josh read those for us a moment ago. And you'll recall that in the first one, it came from the lips of Jesus, and Jesus said, whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. In other words, for our purposes today, the implication is that whenever we receive someone else and show hospitality to that person, we are actually showing hospitality to Jesus, and we're showing hospitality to the God who sent Jesus. And then the other one came from the hand of Paul. And you remember Paul, from what Josh read, said we should always show outsiders or we should always act wisely towards outsiders. And, and then he went on to say that our speech always needs to be gracious and sprinkled with inside. In other words, the implication, again, for us is that the way we treat other people matters deeply. Well, in light of that, this morning, I want to invite to come up here and share with us for just a few minutes two people, and Debbie, Day, and y'all come on up, uh, to share with us a, a little bit about hospitality. These two people know as much about hospitality as anybody I know, and along with them is Yvonne Gentile, and I'm going to introduce them. And Yvonne, just kind of raise your hand for just a moment. And, and uh, this is Debbie Nixon and Dan Entwistle, and they come to us from the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection. Church of the Resurrection is about a 21,000-member church, and it has it has become very, very well-known, not only in Kansas City, but across the nation and really around the world, uh, for how they go about hospitality in their local church. And so I've asked them to come. They've been with us all weekend, all three of them, and, and they've been leading us on a workshop on radical hospitality. And I've asked them to come and to just share a few minutes where you have a limited amount of time. I wish we had more time, but they have graciously agreed to stay over uh, one extra day and, and to spend this time with us. So will you join me in welcoming them to us as they come to us this morning? Thank you. In the workshop, we've been talking about radical hospitality, and, and 
we often hear the word hospitality, and then, and then you brought a different dimension to it. Can you tell us a little bit about hospitality and, and the, the other dimension of radical hospitality? Well, I think first what we want to do is just say good morning to all of you, and uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to be here. There was another football game yesterday also, so <laughs> congratulations to your Atlanta Falcons. Um, and thank you for your prayers of sympathy for our Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> Went down in flames last night in the final minutes of a game. So, but uh, as we begin to think about radical hospitality, um, one of the things that we've talked about is that there is a difference between radical hospitality and friendliness. And most people coming to a church, and there may be first-time visitors here today who can say, yes, I was expecting that um, Dunwoody United Methodist Church would be friendly. But radical hospitality is where we extend ourselves beyond that friendliness um, to welcome strangers among us, not only within the walls of this church, but outside the walls of the church. It's a way that we live. It's our uh, behaviors and attitudes towards others. Yeah, I would just, uh, in many ways, I think we all fall into the habit of attending worship service, and we come as um, attendees. We also participate, but more properly thought of, this is, a, this is a movement of God in this community, and as we gather together, we participate in that movement, and part of that movement is one of welcome, and it's a radical welcome, and uh, how God has included each one of us, and, you know, it's about extending that circle uh, in ways that, that are surprising for people um, because we really do that on God's behalf and not just on the church's behalf or interpersonally. In that sense, it's not customer service. It's, it's a movement of God in which we're, we're participating. Um, Yesterday, it was interesting, during the workshop, you asked us the question. You said, what are some experiences of hospitality that you have experienced that surprised you? And we went around the tables and talked a little bit about that. Can you think of an example or two in which you have experienced radical hospitality? I uh, think about, um, actually, when I first uh, went to the church, I, I shared yesterday that I um, grew up United Methodist, so I had an expectation of what I thought I would experience when I went to a church. But my husband was unchurched and had no church background. So I was really concerned about what he would experience when we went to church. And um, I, we took the leap and went to visit this church. And from the moment we got there, um, there was somebody in the parking lot who greeted us. And there was someone then who took us and noticed that we had two small children and actually walked us to the, the children's space um, and helped us get our children in. And, made us feel welcomed and comfortable from the moment that we got there. And I think I was surprised that it was something different than friendliness, that we felt like we belonged from the moment that we arrived. And then uh, within uh, six hours after that worship service, our, the, somebody was on the doorstep delivering a coffee mug to our house, saying, we're so glad that you were in worship today. And that's what surprised me the most, that they would take the time to actually, on that Sunday, come to our house to say, we would love to be your church family. And that was the moment that my husband and I said, we, we want to go back there. That's great. Well, I would just say, I don't know how many of you, when you arrived to worship this morning, some of you arrived at the perfect time to see, you see your senior pastor with an orange vest. Did any of you see him out in the parking lot this morning <laughs> providing <laughs> radical and surprising hospitality? A few of you here and maybe some who uh, have already left uh, saw that your pastor, I don't think it's a weekly commitment you're making, is it not? <laughs> I will tell you. He said, I'll be here from 6 a.m., beginning <laughs> greeting in the yeah. parking lot, rain <laughs> or shine. <laughs> they were in my office when I was putting on the vest. And I said, you know, I really don't want to do this. <laughs> and I said, but I've committed to it. And, uh, and as I was walking out the door, Debbie said, you might just find you're going to have a blast. And you know what? I did. Actually, being out there, I was able to do what I love to do, which is just to engage people. So it was a great, great experience. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. And, and I might just say that um, when we're talking about radical hospitality, for the sake of, uh, of God's work, um, it is rare that that comes without some discomfort. And uh, it would be easy to say, Dunwoody is a friendly church. And I imagine everybody here, my, uh, my assumption is everybody here would say, we are a friendly church. And when I attend, I feel welcome. We're talking about radical hospitality. It comes with the sacrifice of discomfort, of stepping beyond your immediate circle of friends, 
uh, stepping beyond the, the, the hellos and the perfunctory uh, greetings and, and really to step out of your comfort zone. You may put on an orange vest. Uh, you may take responsibility uh, for those who are on your pew to make certain everyone on that pew uh, at the end of the service or at the beginning of the service would know that they are welcomed in, in this church um, and, and that you care deeply for them. But usually that, that, that accompanies the sense of, I don't know, am I, is, it's a bit uncomfortable at times to step forward in ways that surprise people. Yeah. You mentioned yesterday one of the things we can do in worship. You want to say a little more about that? And I'm, I'm speaking about the pews. Okay, uh, so I might just mention we've moved, we moved into a new sanctuary uh, in April of this last year. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a fairly large sanctuary, and we've intentionally um, arranged the seating section so that uh, people can get to know one another. And, and we want to create intimacy even in, even in a very large church. And the larger you are, the more challenging that is. And Dunwoody is a very large church. Not one, any one person in this room knows the name of everyone else in this room. So what we've done is we've deputized our people uh, to be hospitality um, leaders in the sections where they sit. And some wear a lanyard you know, uh, that identifies them. Others just take responsibility uh, by saying, anybody in my area, we talked yesterday about uh, the 10-foot rule, and I might just mention yeah. that. And that is to take responsibility for everything that happens within 10 feet around you. So 10 feet around you, if there is a piece of paper on the ground that shouldn't be there, you, you, you would pick that up and not wait for one of the staff uh, members to do that. But even more importantly in this regard, that anybody who comes within that, that, uh, that uh, area of you, that you would be attentive to them. There would be a ministry of notice, a ministry of, um, of outreach that you would take responsibility for personally for those who are around you. Okay. I, it was interesting. Uh, the impact that hospitality can have. I was talking to a lady after our last service, and uh, she had a baby, and she was carrying the baby, and she just made a, an interesting point to me. She said, you know, today, I was actually able to listen to the, to the sermon time and to the service, because she said someone uh, came over to me and said, may I take your baby and just uh, hold uh, your daughter for me? Uh, or for you as you just listen to the service and, and it was someone she trusted of course and, and she did and it just meant so much to her to be able to experience that well you mentioned that you're you're you have just moved into a beautiful beautiful sanctuary I've seen it it's lovely uh, magnificent in every way and I want to congratulate you all on that uh, in preparation for your move into that were there things that you were able to do specifically geared towards hospitality because as you know we're going into renovation uh, of our sanctuary and that will begin uh, the second week in May and so are there some things that we can be doing right now in preparation for that? I think one of the most important things that we did in getting ready for that space was remembering our why. Not how we were going to be making these changes, but the why that we were making these changes. And the why was that we could see maybe some changing demographics in our area. We were wanting to reach more uh, young families. We, uh, as we continued to grow larger, um, we needed that sense of intimacy in our, with our seating spaces. So we wanted to make changes so that people could be in community together and that um, we would be a place that young families would be attracted to when it came to worship styles, when it came to times of worship, um, and the programming of excellence that we offer to their children. Um, and so with that, the congregation um, was willing to do some different things. That meant that they were going to go to worship times that were different than what they had been used to. We don't know anything about you don't that know here. <laughs> So thank you to those of you who've had to make uh, changes. We understand that's what happens when you extend radical hospitality, um, is that you're willing to become uncomfortable so that that first time guest, when they arrive, they can be more comfortable. Um, and so changing worship times, changing worship styles. We've had some of our um, congregants have been used to more traditional services, beautiful uh, as this one is, that had to actually give that time up um, to make way for a contemporary service. And that may be some of the things, the conversations that I know that you have had as you look at your new space. But with that, then, we're looking beyond the walls of this church. And that's what radical hospitality does. We look beyond the walls of the church because we see what Christ has done for us. We recognize that because of our love for Christ, we can't help ourselves. We're willing to do things to extend that to others. 
Josh gave me the signal that we're out of time. I, I wish we could continue this conversation for a while. Is, is it not going well? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, and I've said this before, but I would like to ask you to please express to Adam Hamilton, the pastor, to, uh, to your senior leadership, and really to the church as a whole, how much we appreciate their willingness to let three of their key staff people be away for a weekend. Would you join me in thanking Thank them you. for being here this morning? And on behalf of our senior pastor, uh, Adam Hamilton and Church of the Resurrection, uh, we just want to thank you for the invitation to be here. What you are doing is remarkable, and you are setting an example that other churches across our denomination are going to be looking to. And so I want to thank you um, for what it is uh, that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. God bless you. Let me close this segment of our uh, service this morning by telling about an experience I had. Last September, I went out to Church of the Resurrection along with a, a group from our church, a small group, to their leadership institute. Uh, at the close of that seminar, their pastor, uh, Adam Hamilton, told about how he always carries with him in his back pocket a pocket New Testament. And, uh, and then he told about an experience he had. He had gotten on board an, an airplane to take a flight somewhere, and as he got on, he struck up a conversation with the flight attendant, and because of the direction that their conversation took, he decided to do something. He decided that he would take his pocket New Testament and he would underline some parts that he thought might be meaningful to her, and then as they finished the flight, he handed her the pocket New Testament, and he said, listen, uh, I hope this is helpful. And she just said, you have no idea how much this means to me. And, and so then he did an interesting thing. He gave one of the pocket New Testaments to all of us who had attended the seminar. And he said, what I'd like for you to do is to take this pocket New Testament, and I'd like for you to read it. I'd like for you to get caught reading it in different places. He said, I'd like for you to underline it. And he said, I want you to keep it until you bump into somebody that you think might benefit from the New Testament, and then I want you to give it away. Well, I took the New Testament, put it in my back pocket, along with our group. We went to, directly to the airport, and a few minutes later, we boarded our flight. I'm one of those people. I like to sit in my seat. I like to kind of get focused on uh, the screen in front of me, or I read a book or something like that. But almost from the moment I sat down, the lady next to me wanted to engage in conversation. And so she asked about me, and I told her a little bit about me, and, and then I said to her, I said, do you live here in Kansas City? And she said, no, I live in North Carolina. And she said, but I fly into Kansas City every two weeks, and then she began to really open her heart a little bit. And she, she said, you see, my sister uh, is dying of cancer. And she said, you know, she really doesn't have any place for God in her life. Well, I had this pocket New Testament, and I was kind of looking forward to keeping it for a few days. But there was that nudging. You've had those nudgings. And so I, I told her about the seminar, told her about uh, the New Testament, and I said to her, would you like for me to underline some passages that might be meaningful to you and your sister and, uh, and then give you the New Testament? And she said, oh, I really would. And her eyes just kind of lit up like a Christmas tree. So I spent most of the rest of the flight from Kansas City back to Atlanta just underlining different passages and dog-earing the pages so that they would be easy to find. And then as we were making our final approach, I just handed her the New Testament. And their New Testament has on it the, the name of the church and Church of the Resurrection. And, and I said, you know, you can just use this and, and maybe while you're in Kansas City, 
you can go to Church of the Resurrection. Now, I don't know if she'll make it to the church. I don't know what will happen. We never know, do we, when we share those kinds of things. But sometimes they really connect and they meet people where they are. At the close of this service, we're going to have communion first, but at the close of this service, we've got the ushers at the doors, and they're going to hand out New Testaments to you. It's got the name of the church on the back of it. I want to invite you to take one of these New Testaments, and I want to invite you to put it in your back pocket and to read it and to underline it, dog ear passages, and keep it until you bump into somebody who might need it. Maybe this afternoon, maybe next week, maybe a month from now or a year from now. But would you be willing to do that? What an act of hospitality, taking the grace and the love that God has given to us and then sharing that with others. Is it a deal? Nod your head if it's a deal. Say amen if it's a deal. All right, let's pray. Gracious and loving God. Help us to take the grace that you have given to us and to share that with others in all sorts of different ways. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.